be a little bit longer because we have finished the book, inshallah. We have about uh, a little less than 10 pages, inshallah. Bismillah. We'll have Ibrahim start. Bismillah. Part 5, The Road to Peace, the Treaty of Hodeya. And it dwells upon the map. Oh, that's okay. This after the dawn. The Prophet set out with 1,400 Muslims to visit the Kaaba. Such a move may have appeared in, to be insane, given the circumstances. But he had re received a revelation from Allah in the form of a dream that he was visiting the Kaaba with his head, safe, head, head shaved. The, Muslim, the group of Muslims headed by the Prophet made it clear to everyone that they were purely a, a religious mission, that there was, there was nothing out of the ordinary. Whatever the other tribe wished to visit Mecca, they would usually go during the safer months where fighting is prohibited, not carry any special weapons for war, and take a lot of animals intended to be sacrificed in Mecca. As soon as the Quraysh found out about this, they praised to Allah. They could not let their sworn enemy enter Mecca. At the same time, they could not stop or harm them and risk losing the honor of Arabia. All right, so here they went to Dukhata. Dukhata is one of the sacred months. Sacred months meaning there's no fighting allowed in that month. Dukhata, Dukhita, um, Habra, and Vajr. Those are the four months where fighting is not allowed. So they went to Dukhata and then they didn't take weapons with them, right? All they took was if somebody tried to, uh, some animal or some uh, you know, predator tried to attack the animals that they were carrying for slaughter, they could defend themselves. That's all they carried with them. So they were trying to make it known that their intentions were uh, noble, that they just wanted to be able to perform Umrah, because they had some had some, 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 a dream that the Muslims were performing Umrah. Alright, then. They decided to send Khalid ibn Walid with 200 horsemen to threaten Umrah and Muslims. But the Prophet evaded this battle, battle warning. Battalion. Battalion, 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 sorry. By taking a detour around Makkah. Shortly after, the Muslims really reached a plain known as al Hudaybiyah, just outside of Makkah. The Prophet uh, dispatched a man to inform the leaders that they did not come to fight just to visit the Kaaba Omar. They also, he also indicated that they wished to sign a peace treaty. The Prophet hoped that after after that wait, hoped that after the failed attack on Medina, they would con consider peace with the Muslims, they would, which they would grant their caravans of slave passage to Syria as well. The negotiators was said to convince the Muslims to in return to return home, but they persisted in, in their right to res, uh, visit the Kaaba. Three more negotiators were sent, one after another, but every time an agreement was made, the Quraysh rejected it. Finally, the Prophet sent, decided to send Uthman, who had still had many tribal connections to Mecca, to no negotiate an agreement with the Quraysh. So now that's like a negotiation process, right? All right they want to come. And the thing about Hudaybiyah, Hudaybiyah is very close to Mecca. It's just a few miles outside of Mecca. And when you go for normal, you can actually see where Hudaybiyah is. So it's like they're so close, right? They made that 400 mile journey, and it's like the last like 15, 20 miles are left and then they're not able to go. And that's something that adds to what's going to happen, adds to the angst of the Muslims that, you know, why can't we go? All right, Osama, continue, please. Three days passed and there was no word from Uthman. The rumor arose that he had been killed, which meant a clear open uh, declaration to prepare for battle. Prophet Sallallahu acted quickly, calling all his companions around him. They did not come prepared for war, so they had no armor or shield. But it was customary to carry swords and arrows while traveling through the desert. Prophet some sat under a tree while every companion with male and female pledged that they would support the Prophet to death. This pledge became known later as the pledge of Uthman, satisfaction. Since Allah revealed that he was pleased with those who undertook such a note. However, soon after, the rumor proved to be false and it's not returned. Okay. It says, mention of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with those that took a pledge allegiance to under the tree. Right? So this is mentioned in the Quran that they basically pledge allegiance that if they have to fight to the death, they're gonna to have to fight to the death. If they're going to be attacked and Rahman al Allah was killed, then they're gonna do whatever they need to do to make sure that they're they're uh, able to practice the religion. And he took the one of his hands and he said, This is Earth man, and he pledged allegiance on behalf of Rahman al So they found out that the rumors were false. 
But then they they offered, they said, you want to do Umrah? Go ahead. But not with the Prophet said, said, how am I going to be here, do Umrah, while the rest of the Muslims are over there, not able to do Umrah? Right? So then he ended up coming back to Arabia, and then there was a person named Suhail, and the Prophet said, if he gives me any condition, which is uh, towards peace, I'm going to agree to it. Because Prophet wanted peace. And he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِن جَنَحُ لِسَلْمِ فَجَنَحُ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّرَ Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if they lead towards peace, you also lead towards it, and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If they want to uh, deceive you after that, Allah is enough for you. Don't worry. But if someone comes with and tries to make things better, you know, try to make things better, lean towards peace, and then put your trust in Allah. If they try to deceive you and you lean towards peace and you try to put uh, work towards peace because you put trust in Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you. Alright, good. Continue a little song. Well, not the only good news, but a man named Sufan ibn Amr was sent by the Quraysh to negotiate. He was a very important and clever man, and it was clear that the Meccans were finally willing to compromise. The determination of the Muslims had pressured them to opt for peace. Sharp and heated discussions between the Prophet and the Sahil continued for a long time. For a long time, until the agreement was finally written down in the The treaty continued to follow the Muslims. One, the Muslims and the Quraysh would not fight each other for, uh, for a period of 10 years. Two, the Muslims would return to Medina and not be allowed to visit the Kaaba this year. However, they would, uh, they would be allowed to visit the Kaaba next year for immediately. Three, if any Muslim from Medina decided to leave Islam and return to Mecca, they would be allowed to do so. However, if any, anyone from Mecca decided to accept Islam and go to Medina, he would, he would return to the Quraysh. For both parties could make alliances with any tribes that they wished, and they would also be uh, they would also be bound by the treaty. When the companions when the companions found out about the agreement, they saw that uh, Islam they, they saw it as a slap in the face. Not only was their pilgrimage delayed and severely restricted the following year, but an unfair agreement to return and any persecu- any persecuted Muslim back to Mecca was agreed to. <coughs> only moments ago they agreed to fight to death, and now they were insulted with a one-sided agreement. But the Prophet did not consult them this time. As no leader, the agreement or the command from Allah, and, and there is no room for anyone's opinion. So. Okay, during this time, Subhanallah, this is something which is when you read in the Sirah, it's one of the most difficult things to read in the Sirah. Uh, Abu Jandal. So he was the negotiator on behalf of the Quraysh. The son Abu Jandal escaped and came to the Muslims in shackles, right, in chains, and he said, "Please take me to Medina with you." And so he said, "No, we agreed." Look at the condition. Look at condition number three. If uh, anyone from Makkah decided to accept Islam and go to Medina, he would be returned to the Quraysh. So, you can't take him. And at that time, the companions were like, this person, he's coming to us for help. And we're not going to be able to help him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no. Because we agreed to this condition. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easier for him. Later on, he made it to go and met Abu Basir and others. They managed to go out, and I'll explain what happened after that. But imagine at that time what happened to the companions of the Allah. How upset they were, how in shock they were, how disappointed they were. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a larger plan. And sometimes when we don't see things uh, as they are in immediacy and uh, right away, don't forget who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in, is in charge of everything. Sometimes we need reminders of that. Umar al Allah, later on in his life, he said, I still make a stiff fall, give sadaqah, make tawbah, because of how I acted on, on that day. He went to the Prophet and said, Aren't we on the truth? Aren't you the Messenger of Allah? Uh, why are we agreeing to this treaty? He said, Because we are on the truth and because I am the Messenger of Allah. Then Umar al Allah went, and this annoys me personally too. If you say something to me directly and we have a conversation, don't go to someone else and try to get them to convince me. Umar al did the same thing. He went to Abu Bakr al and Abu Bakr al literally, if you take the words of the Prophet the words of Abu Bakr al matched up. Exactly. We're doing this because he's the Messenger of Allah and because we are the truth. Because Abu Bakr al he didn't know the wisdom behind it. But he knew that the Prophet ﷺ was being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things you look at here is that this thing, although, yes, the terms of the treaty are seemingly unfair to the Muslims, okay? But, what did we say? Who do you, do you make a treaty with? Do you make a treaty with people you don't recognize? 
This is the first recognition that they made that they're an actual body that we have to make a treaty with. Remember, before that, they were going to tell them they're, in, in, uh, they're just an inconvenience, they're insignificant, they're just a small group of people. Now they officially began to recognize them. Okay? So, um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, okay, at this time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the Mubina. The Fath of Mecca is going to come, but the Treaty of Hadibia is what preceded that. How many Muslims are here at this time? The Bayar of one took place in how many? 1400. 1400. Okay? When the Fath of Mecca happens two years later, how many are there going to be? 10,000. Just in two years. Islam up until this point, this is the sixth year of Hijrah, 13 years in Mecca. Six years in Medina, how many years is that? 19. 19 years of giving da'wah, 1400. Within two years after that, after peace, what happens? Right. Yes, they get up to 10,000. So it shows you when people are safe, they're not worried about their lives, they're not worried about if they're getting killed if they go outside, then they're able to think and reason and understand. So what ended up happening to Abu Zayd and Abu Basir and others is that Prophet Sallallahu he said, look, I have to send them back to uh, Mecca because that's what we agreed to. So these guys, what they did was on their way back to Mecca, they escaped, right? They escaped and they went towards Jiddah. And when they were going to Jiddah, Jiddah was a port, right? So any people who are traveling through Jiddah from the non-Muslims, Right? The, the Abu Basir, Abu Jaddal, and other Muslims, they began to attack them. So eventually, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Mushrikun came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and said, These people, your people are attacking us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, They're not my people because I don't have any control over them. You told them they can't be with me. So the Quraysh went and said, Please take these guys, they're bothering us too much. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahlul Wasallam. They told them, Stop. Then they stopped. Right? So sometimes things happen in different ways. Sure. Yes. Quick question. The the restriction was only from the people that lived in the city of Mecca at the time that they couldn't be allowed to come? It wasn't any of the outskirts. It wasn't any of the outskirts, yeah. It was only the people who were allied with the Quraysh, basically, and people who lived in Mecca. Yeah. Alright, Islam spreads. Let's have Hamza. Islam spreads. As soon as the Muslims departed, the Prophet, the Prophet received a new resolution. Indeed, we have opened up a path to clear victory for you, referring to the newly signed peace treaty. After so many years of persecution and warfare, there was finally peace. Muslims and idolaters, Arabs, began to interact freely and regularly meet each other. Within the next two years, more people would, would accept Islam than in the past 18 years. An environment of pressure and hostility be prevents people from thinking clearly. Shortly afterwards, even Stantris, enemies of Islam, like Khalid, who was responsible for the slaughter of Uhud, and Amr ibn al-As, who attempted to extradite the Muslims from Abyssinia, opened their hearts towards the message of Islam. And Uthman ibn Talqa, as Uthman ibn Talqa, his family had the keys to the Kaaba. So all these people they accept, started to accept Islam. Alright, go ahead. The following year, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, sent envies with letters addressed to the leaders of all the, all the major powers in and around Arabia. Most of the letters were similar. They began in the name of Allah, declared that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, invited the leaders to accept Islam and warned them that if they rejected, they would have to bear the responsibility of preventing the message from reaching their followers. The king of Abyssinia and the king of Bahrain accepted Islam while Kisra, the emperor of Persia, angrily tore the letter to pieces and killed the Muslim envoy. Prophet said that as he uh, tore the letter, Allah is going to tear up his kingdom. And that's eventually what happened. Right? It took a, a little bit longer for the Muslims to take over the Byzantines with the Persians. It went relatively quickly. Okay. The ruler of northern Arabia also responded with hostility and threatened to attack Medina. The king of Egypt, Muqawwas, gladly declined to accept Islam, but sent gifts to the Prophet as a, Prophet as a gesture of goodwill. The Prophet accepted such gifts and maintained friendly relations with them. When Heracles, the emperor of Byzantine, Received his team, he received the letter, he began, he began to investigate the issue. He ordered his guards to fetch any Arabs that happened to be in the region so he could ask them some questions. It so happened that no other than Abu Sufyan was in the area on a, on a business venture. He was summoned into the Roman court and his followers were made to stand behind him. Heraclius told him that he would ask him a number of questions about this man who claims to be a prophet and his followers would catch him from behind him. If he was telling a lie, it was a genius tactic to both assert, assert in the truth and give the witness the safety of contradicting their leaders. Alright, so let's have uh, Hamza, you be Heraclius, uh, Muzammar, you be Abu Sufyan. 
What is the status of his lineage amongst you? He has a noble lineage. Has anyone prior to him made such a claim before? No. Were any of his ancestors a king? No. Do the noble people follow him or the weak and poor ones? The weak and poor. Are his followers increasing or decreasing? They are increasing. Are people leaving his religion of dislike after entering into it? No. Did you ever accuse him of lying before he made this claim? No. Has he ever deceived you? No, but we have a peace treaty right now and we, we don't know uh, how he might act. What does he command you to do? He wants us to only worship Allah and abandon idolatry. He wants us to abandon the ways of our ancestors, pray and give charity, etc. Yeah, that's it. Heraclius responded, I have asked you all these questions to determine whether he's a, he is a true prophet. Prophets always appear from the noble families among their people. If someone before him had, had made the same claim, I could say that he might be imitating them. If one of his ancestors was a king, I could say that he might be trying to restore his kingdom. Since you told me that he, he was never accused of lying, I would wonder why he would refrain from lying to people but then lie about God. He told me that the poor, the poor and the weak follow him, that that is the case with most prophets of God. He continued explaining the reason behind each question until it became clear to everyone in the royal court that he was inclined towards Islam. The, 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 the dignitaries, dignitaries who were Christian began shouting and yelling. When he realized that his people would never accept Islam, he quieted them down and said, I was only testing you to see how loyal you are to me. The people calmed down and prostrated themselves in front of him as it was customary. It is unknown that it was really in it was it is unknown what was really in his heart and what happened after that. Yeah, so uh, it, one of the things that when we talked about uh, even the Arabs and Jahiliya who before Islam they had certain virtues. And one of the things that they were very afraid of is being exposed as a liar. So Abu Sufyan he said the only reason he told the truth is because he didn't want his people to think that he was a liar. And that's why even he he testified even though he disagreed with a lot of what the Prophet was calling to, but he had agreed to uh, answer the questions honestly and truthfully because he was afraid of being exposed as a liar. Um, Heraclius, uh, there's one narration that says that if what all of you are saying is true, he's going, his religion is going to come and to rule where my feet are right now. And some scholars say that this was to put place in um, Syria. Others say that it took place in uh, Constantinople, right? most likely Syria. There's other narrations that the people of Constantinople, even then, after they left Syria, they knew that Islam was going to flourish over there. But when did Islam get over there? Like 1453. Right? We're still, this is around a few years, or four years approximately before the Prophet passed away, so 628. So Islam, you know, it spread very quickly, rapidly. Alright, so now, another thing that happens is Muslims are still uh, a little bit down about what happened after Debiya. The next year, they do go and perform Amrah. Right? But during that time, the seventh year of Hijrah, there's halakha. Halakha means that they, there's action. If they're just going to dwell and say that, oh, I wish we could go to Mecca, I wish we could go to Mecca, I wish we could go to Mecca, then they're not going to be able to move forward. So what happens in the seventh year is the siege of Khaybar happens and the battle of Muta happens because it makes the Muslims move on. Yes, you can't go to Mecca this year, but there's other things that you can do. So go do those other things, and then when it's time for you to go to Mecca, you'll be able to go to Mecca. So that's a lesson for our lives. There are certain things we may want to do, but don't get so engrossed in that that you prevent yourself from looking at other options and doing other things. Right? There's so many people that happens to. They, they, you know, there's a, in the statement, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Right? Because of that basket, hey, you don't have any eggs left. So look at different things. Try to look at, okay, yes, it, it did turn out the way that I wanted, but what else can I do? How can I occupy my time until things become better? All right, let's have what's up, Mel? Siege of Kleba. There was relative peace in Arabia, particularly between the Muslims of Quraysh and all the other tribes who entered into alliances with either one of them. However, there was one major enemy left in the north of Medina that had no intention of allying with the Muslims or even now with Quraysh for that matter. The truth of Kleba <coughs> were heavily influenced by the members of the Quaynupah and Nadir, who blamed the Prophet for their uh, expulsion from Medina, they were far from being a mutual party. In fact, it is from Khaybar that the Quraysh were incited to amass, to amass allied forces and attack Medina only two years ago. The Prophet ﷺ received intelligence that they were plotting against the Muslims, so he decided to put an end to danger before the situation became worse. <coughs> 
Faber considered of several, several heavily fortified buildings and had, had the ability to muster up over 10,000 soldiers with the help of their allies. The Prophet decided to take them by surprise in Muharram 7th uh, after, after the drum. The Muslim, uh, the Muslim army consisted of only 1,800 soldiers, 1,600 soldiers, soldiers who traveled by night and surrounded some of their fortresses. When they awoke in the morning, they realized that their communications had already been cut off and supplies blocked. This was a perfect opportunity to draft a treaty of peace, but they insisted on war. The Muslims concentrated on one fort at a time, beginning with the weakest first. Fort after fort began to surrender. The fort after fort began to surrender to the siege. The last fort was the most difficult to break, and its siege alone lasted two weeks. They finally surrendered on the condition that they would not be killed. After they were defeated, they attempted to, be, to bargain with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He eventually allowed them to stay in Khaybar, uh, since it was a very fertile, fertile and fertile land, and they were experts in taking care of it. But in exchange for a crop tax that had to, pay, that had to be paid to Muslims, the siege concluded on, on all uh, hostilities between the Jews and the Muslims. That's it. This is how the Khaybar, right? They overtook them and they let them stay there and they had them chill, uh, take care of the land and give some of the product, produce and uh, whatever benefits to the Muslims, right? So this is what ended up happening here. All right. The expedition of Mu'tah, uh, this is again something which is very difficult. But the Prophet said some of the Muslims, they dealt with it and Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them better for it. Uh, let's have Muhammad say. The expedition of Muta. A few months later, a group of Muslims traveling towards Syria were murdered by the Muslim tribe who were allied with the Romans. The Prophet had to respond, so he sent 3,000 soldiers led by Zayd ibn Thabit. He knew that this was near Roman territory and was fully aware of the massive forces that the Roman Romans had at their disposal. Before he announced that if Zayd uh, died, the father would be put in charge and if he was killed. Ja'far will be put in charge, and if he was killed, Abdullah ibn Muwaiha would take over. The Arab tribes banded together and and were reinforced by the Byzantine imperial troops. The army numbered over 100,000 fully equipped soldiers. So imagine 3,000 versus 100,000. <coughs> um, and Muslims, they were like thinking, should we go forward or not? Abdullah ibn Muwaiha stood up and said, what do you want? Right? Either way, this is going to end up good for you. Either you're going to win or you're going to get shahada. Let's go. Right? So they went forward. Good. The Muslims had never seen such a large army before in their life. They consulted one another on whether they should send a message to the Prophet about the size of the army. However, it was decided that they should proceed as planned and not be afraid of the odds. The fighting, the fighting began and all three leaders were killed. Afterwards, the Muslims appointed Khalid ibn al walid to take charge of the army. He rearranged the army in such a way that they were able to retreat without much further loss of life. When they reached Medina, the Prophet wasallam was very sad that his own adopted son and cousin had been killed. But the Prophet wasallam was very proud of Khalid's genius strategy and nicknamed him the Sword of Allah. Now, subhanAllah, when you read this, it's, it's, uh, I'm just, um, so it was myself that I forgot his companion's name. So basically, they had a, they had a succession plan. It was uh, Zayd, Jafar, and Abdullah and Abu'l-Aqa. All of them were made shaheed. There's another companion, a senior companion. I'm just forgetting his name. And I'm upset I'm doing that because what he did was very, very courageous, very brave, and very difficult to do. He to, they appointed him as a leader, and he said, "Look, I appreciate it, and but Khalid is here." Khalid is more qualified. Khalid radiallahu anhu, he was recently accepted Islam, and he's like, no, you participate in the battle of Badr, the people chose you, you should be their leader. He said, that's fine, I appreciate the sentiment, but you know what you're doing here better than I do. So you take it, and you go with it. And then Khalid radiallahu anhu accepted. Then the Prophet said, a safe from the suyuf Allah guided them back. So, that's very important for us to know our kind of our limitations. That look, I, yes, I appreciate your trust in me, but Part of that is because I've been honest with you and I don't know what to do here. Khalid does. Let's trust him to help us in this situation. So technically, if you want to say the Battle of Mu'ta is kind of a loss, it was. Because if you talk about a lot of their people were in Shaheed. But in another way, it was a win because 
the people who were allied with the Romans, it wasn't because they were allied with them because they agreed with them. They were just afraid of them. Right? So if you have Arab that are allied with the Romans because it's a Roman Empire, then you have other Arab that are willing to stand up to the Roman Empire. What are the Arabs that are allied with the Romans going to do? They're going to go side with Arab. Right? And that's eventually what happened. Is that they're like, okay, we, are, we don't have to be afraid of them. The Muslims, well, can fight them. They're willing to do that. If we break away from the Romans, then we have other people that can potentially help us. So that in that way, it was a win. All right, the conquest, yes. Why were they trying to fight them? Because, look, uh, right over here, uh, a group of Muslims traveling towards Syria were murdered by the Hassan tribe for allied with the Romans. Because they killed some of their people. Right, and then that's the thing. Remember, on the way to Syria, that people used to travel to Syria all the time for business. So if one of these guys get killed and we don't do anything, then what happens is we're going to kill some more of our people. Yeah. Alright, yes. So when it says that all the leaders were killed, you must have been there? Yeah, right. Oh. The people, the succession prophets, are right? Zaid, Jarfa, and Abdullah al Ar. Those are the leaders. And they, they kind of knew. They kind of knew. Because Prophet usually wouldn't do that. But he said, if Zaid is killed, then Jarfa. If Jarfa is killed, Abdullah al Ar. And then if that happens, choose a leader from among yourselves. So then they kind of had that thing that Prophet usually doesn't say that. So we're probably going to be a Shaheed in that. But imagine. The people who are very close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Zaid is the adopted son, and we talked about that. And then Jarfa, who is Jarfa? Cousin. And remember, he was in Abyssinia, and then he came, joined them. And oh, that's another thing. After the, um, sorry, after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the people from Abyssinia came to Medina because they were safe now. They were safe. They were living in safety in Abyssinia. The threat of the Mushrikun was gone now. And now that's how the numbers increased as well. A lot of people from Abyssinia came to Medina. Alhamdulillah, they lived with the Muslims in Medina. All right, conquest of Mecca. Let's have a question. <clears throat> the conquest of Mecca. In eight uh, AH, the tribe of Bakr attacked the Khuzra tribe who was allied with the Muslims. Khuzra immediately asked the Prophet ﷺ for help. Since the Bakr were allied with the Quraysh, this was a violation of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and it later turned out that the Quraysh had supplied their ally with weapons to launch the attack. The Quraysh knew that they were guilty, so they sent Abu Sufyan to Medina and tried to negotiate a treaty. The Prophet was a man of his word and needed to help his allies, so he remained silent and said nothing in response. The Quraysh were unclear as to what, what this was supposed to mean. Was the treaty still in effect or broken? A few weeks later, the Prophet issued orders for several armies to begin marching toward different locations, fully armed. Rumors were circulated that perhaps he was, he was headed to fight the Romans again, or maybe he was at an east event the Muslim creatures that had been murdered. Within a few days, the various armies received instructions that they were, they were to head straight from Mecca and surround it from all sides. Mecca woke up one morning and found itself completely surrounded by a massive Muslim army. The tactic was to startle the Quraysh and find them surrendering, surrendering peacefully without putting up any fight. Abu Sufyan, viewing the situation and being fully aware of the dedication of the Muslims, decided to give up. The Messenger of Allah entered Mecca with a massive army and headed straight for the Kaaba. He announced it to the leaders who had fought him, persecuted his followers, and attempted to kill him on several occasions. Today you are all free to go. I will not take revenge on you. Upon witnessing the leniency of the Prophet, many Meccans embraced Islam. Then he entered the Kaaba and, and had each and every single idol removed and destroyed. The law set, ascended the structure and made the call to prayer from the roof of the Kaaba. Centuries had passed since the building was constructed by Ibrahim and his son had been dedicated solely to worshiping Allah alone. So if you look at the, go back to the treaty, the fourth clause was any uh, allies, anybody can ally with the Muslims, anybody can ally with the Mushrikun, and the terms of the treaty um, are, are in effect. So what happened was that the Mushrikun, they supplied weapons to one of the allies that used it to attack an ally of the Muslims. And then the Muslims now, remember, the Muslims have grown now. They're not the 1400. They're a strong number. Remember, even the Ahzab, the Ahzab, the Confederates, weren't just the Mushrikun, but there were people from other places of Arabia, Jews and all that. They had 10,000. Now the Muslims were 10,000 strong. Now the Muslims, they went and they, were at, they could have attacked. They could have attacked. And Abu Sufyan knew that they messed up, so he came to Medina and he tried to talk to the Prophet and it's not mentioned here, but uh, his daughter, Umm Habiba anha, was a, a wife of the Prophet and she didn't let him talk to the Prophet without his permission. Then Abbas, Prophet's uncle, he had him talk to the Prophet Abu Sufyan accepted Islam, and when they went to Mecca, the Prophet said anybody who enters Abu Sufyan's house is safe. Right? Anyone who enters. Uh, Abu Sufyan's house, sorry. 
Abu Sufyan's house is safe, and he let the people go. And because of that leniency and generosity, a lot of people accepted Islam. They thought the Prophet he would have been justified. Right? He would have been justified according to their customs and treaty, that uh, culture, to have them executed, to punish them, to lay a war on them. And a lot of times that's what people do. Right? Why? If you look at even in the Quran, it's mentioned. Why when uh, uh, Sulaiman wrote the letter to Bilqis, why didn't she come to him right away? Because she said that when people come into a town, they humiliate the people that take over a town, they humiliate the people that are living in that town, and that's what people do. So if the, we're in a position of power, and Sulaiman comes and takes uh, over, he's going to humiliate us, and we're going to be inferior. And that's the fear that they had. That's why the Prophet said, uh, they came to the Prophet said, Ya Kareem ibn Kareem, O oh son, O oh generous one, the son of the generous one. And the Prophet said, go, said, go, you're free. And not only that, you see that, alhamdulillah, a lot of them accepted Islam. And a lot of them accepted Islam because they're afraid. But you see how the Prophet deals with them in the Battle of Hunayn and al -Taif. Let's have, uh, let's say. The They marched out with the strong army and uh, encamped in the valley of Pone, a few miles east of Mecca, with uh, their archers strategically <coughs> st strategically positioned on the hills. The Prophet set out with 12,000 Muslims to intercept them. This was the largest and most well equipped army the Muslims had ever uh, amassed, and there seemed to be some signs of pride in the army ranks. As they entered the valley, they were taken by surprise and showered with arrows from all sides. The narrowness, the narrowness of the valley squeezed them in, and many of the Muslim soldiers began to disperse in all directions. Among the few standing firm was the Prophet who maintained his ground. Eventually, he was able to rally his troops again <coughs> and, and launch a counterattack. Within a short span of time, the tides had turned and the enemy was in retreat. Allah SWT mentioned this in the Quran <coughs> When your numbers pleased you. Right? Think about it, subhanAllah. Any, it would be natural. From 1600 in Muta to 12,000. They're like, look, when we had 1600, we put up a fight against, oh, sorry, when we had 300, we put up a fight against the Romans. When we had 1600, we put up a fight against the Romans. These are Arab people, we have 12,000. There's no way we're going to lose by numbers. Somebody, some of them actually said that. That we're not going to lose by numbers. If we're going to lose, we're going to lose, but it's not going to be because of numbers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, but numbers don't help you if Allah doesn't help you. Numbers don't matter if Allah doesn't help you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put sakina, calmness and tranquility to the Prophet and to the believers. Because in, in war, in times of adversity, if we don't have peace, Right? If we don't have the uh, calmness, we don't have the ability to think, then you know, it makes it very difficult. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them here and gave them victory. And alhamdulillah, the people, they made tawbah and they realized that, look, it doesn't matter how big we get. The most important thing is that we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help and support on our side. Go ahead, uh, let's, uh, let's continue. It led to a ta'af where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had been kicked out and humiliated only a decade ago. The Muslims pursued and watched a siege on the heavily fortified city. After two long weeks of fighting, it was clear that the leaders of the city had enough supplies to last them the, the entire year. So the Muslim army let them be. The Hawazin had already been defeated and they posed no major threat anymore. After the Battle of Hunayn, the Muslim army had spoils of war like they had never seen in their lives. There were thousands of prisoners and tens of thousands of camels and sheep left by the army who foolishly brought all their uh, possessions to the battlefield. When the time came to distribute the wealth, the Prophet ﷺ began by giving large amounts to the new Muslims who had only accepted Islam after the conquest of Mecca. Like the uh, leaders like Abu Sufyan and uh, Abu Sufyan and his family were given hundreds of camels and sheep, and received even more when they uh, when they demanded a larger share. <coughs> share. When the helpers who had no direct family relations with the people of Mecca heard about this unequal distribution, they began to complain. 
The Prophet ﷺ gathered them and explained, I give to one group of people while another group is clear to my heart. Dear, dear. Dear, dear to my heart. Are you not... <coughs> Are you not satisfied that I will return to Medina and reside, reside permanent, permanently with you? The helpers, after brief reflection, got, to, uh, got the point immediately. These new Muslims were only being favored because their faith was weak. Unlike the helpers who had no such weakness and therefore did not require any monetary favoritism. The Prophet ﷺ returned with his uh, companions to Medina near the end of the eighth year of after Hijrah. Yeah. So, subhanAllah, here the Prophet ﷺ after Hunayn, he did favor them. <laughs> you know, they thought that by accepting Islam, it would negatively impact them from a financial and worldly standpoint. But, um, alhamdulillah, Islam did not negatively impact them, rather it benefited them. And there's so many people, uh, you'll see it throughout our history and our tradition, even in contemporary times, that they accept Islam, or hasun Islam, that their Islam improved. So a lot of the people of Mecca, they didn't accept Islam because of the theological implications and the theological conviction. But they, after they accepted Islam, when Islam started benefiting them, alhamdulillah, they saw the benefits and the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then their Islam grew. Okay? Um, and this is a fear that the Ansar had, that a home is always sweet to people, right? People always want to go home. And this is the Prophet's home, Mecca's his home. So the Prophet said, well, he said, look, I'm trying to give them, but I'm going to go back with you. And they said, your presence with us is more important than any monetary thing. And that's why the Prophet said, and subhanAllah, it wasn't only the Prophet right? If you look at uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, where were they all from? They were all from Mecca. But they had Medina, they adopted Medina as their home, and subhanAllah, they had that something that was just very, very dear to them, and they never forgot. Just because Mecca is accessible now, they can go there, it's free, that's, they can go back. They never forgot the, um, you know, not, I would say, they never forgot the, uh, that is the word I'm looking for, the generosity of the companions of Medina, and that was, they had a special place in his heart. Ali radiallahu who eventually moved the Khilafah to Kufa, one of the reasons he said he did that, he said that he doesn't want more blood to be spell, spilled in the city of the Prophet wasallam. Because he knew when he took over the Khilafah, there was contentious times of Man had just been assassinated, and there were many wars that happened. He said he wants to keep Medina out of it. He wants to keep Medina out of it. Okay? Alright, expedition of Tabuk. Next major event, Aramayu. In Rajab of the year ninth, uh, in, in Rajab of the ninth year after Hijra, the Muslims received intelligence that the Romans were preparing to attack Medina. <coughs> Arabia was never really seen as any threat to either the Persians or the Romans since the Arabs had never been united before. The Prophet, despite the hot summer and famine, decided to go and meet them before they could enter Arabia. It was it was one of the most difficult missions since the journey was long. The summer he was intense and the Roman forces were among the most disciplined and well equipped in the world. The Prophet Sallallahu asked everyone to donate whatever they could for the cause. People like Abu Bakr gave away their wealth, while more while the more wealthy Muslims donated large sums of money and supplies. Despite all the generosity, there were many people who could not afford to join the army and return home with tears and dread. Thirty thousand companions set out with the Prophet. Yeah. Um, so here, uh, so from this part here, is uh, okay. So the first, if you look at the order, uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, it put the situation of Mushrikun on, on pause, and the Fatah Mecca took care of that. Khaybab took care of the Jewish problems that they were going through with the Jews, right? And now another thing that uh, Tabuk is going to do, it's going to address the issue with the Munafiqun. Right? So this is what happens here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, if you look at uh, Surah Tawbah, it has a lot of information about the Ghazwa Tabu. Uh, even though subhanahu wa said no fighting takes place. No fighting takes place, but it exposes the Munafiq one. Right? They say that, um, they say that, no, it's too far. لا تنفروا في الحق قل نار جهنم وشد حمر لو كان يفقمون They say that it's so, it's so hot, don't go ahead and hot. Allah says the fire of hell is hot, hotter. It's far, it's very far. They say, no, no, if it was closer, we would have gone. No, it's not about the distance, it's about the commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing they said, Allah, they said that uh, right? They said, uh, They said, look, 
the Roman women are so beautiful. If we go near them, we're going to fall into fitna. So protect us and excuse us from going into uh, this Roman territory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed them, right? That's why one of the surahs of, um, one of the names of Surah Tawbah is Fadiha. It's because it exposes the munafiqeen. So Tabuk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see that no physical fighting takes place. But the munafiq won't get exposed because all of these things, and they make excuses. They'll make excuses to you when you return to them, right? Oh, this is why we couldn't go, please excuse us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you may forgive them, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive them. Okay? Alright, 30,000 companions set up, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Towards the north. When they reached the Tabuk in northern Arabia, the Romans were nowhere to be found. It seems that they were they were scared off by the approaching Muslim army, but the Prophet camped there for 20 days just in case they might consider an attack. The sheer size of the Muslim army sent a message to both Arabia and the Byzantine Empire. The Muslims were forced to be reckoned with. Several tribes in the north got the message and realized that they would no longer need an ally with the Romans to guarantee their security. So they drafted peace treaty. So they drafted a peace treaty with the Pops Law. Right. When the Muslim army returned to Medina, there were accounts to be settled. The Prophet uh, had made it very, uh, very clear that <coughs> the all able bodied Muslims were hired to march out on this expedition, despite the hardships involved. The only ones who were exempt from such duty were the old and the ill. Yet there were several people who remained behind and they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam making various excuses. It didn't take a genius to figure out that these were the hypocrites who stayed behind. But the Prophet, Prophet Sallallahu accepted their excuses at least out, outwardly. There were three Muslims, however, who openly admitted that they had no excuse but their own laziness. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi instituted a 50-day long social boycott on these three. No Muslim wanted want to speak to them or communicate with them in any way. Uh, since these were true believers, the most difficult thing for them was to be unable to communicate with the Prophet Sallallahu himself. After 50 days, a revelation came down that Allah had forgiven them. They were extremely thankful and had learned their lesson. Where is this from? Where is this mentioned in the Quran? Alright, go ahead and continue. After the con conquest of Mecca and the expedition of the group, dozens of Arab tribes throughout the entire peninsula began sending delegations to Medina in order <coughs> to officially declare their acceptance of Islam. Most of the Arabs had taken uh, a wait and see attitude to the conflict between the Muslims and the Quraysh. Many of them had uh, many of them had an ins intrinsic uh, intrinsic belief that if Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was indeed a true prophet, then Allah would give them was then Allah would give them victory. Now it was clear to them that the Muslims were indeed victorious, so they pledged their loyalty. However, not all these tribes were sincere in their beliefs. Verses were revealed about the reality of some people who pro professed prophet Islam in their tongues. The desert Arab, the desert Arabs say, You have believed. Tell them you have not believed, rather you say you have committed Faith has not entered your heart. What is this? Which verse is this? Qalatil Arabu Amanda. Qulum tumino arayku kulu asnamna. Qulum ma yakul imanu fi kulu bikum. Some people came. They said that oh, we we used to go and call people to Islam. We did you a favor by accepting Islam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said no. Allah did you a favor by guiding you to Islam. Right. So this is something that uh, you have to always be on guard of of arrogance, of urj, of men of thinking we're doing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or anyone else any favors. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing us the favor by choosing us to serve Him. Right? Very easily. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can replace all of us and bring a whole new creation that will not be like us. Right? <coughs> Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for using us and not replacing us. All right, go ahead, Omar. Uh, the Quran made it clear that someone may acquire certain benefits in this world by entering the fold of Islam outwardly, but it but will only really benefit from it when they enter wholeheartedly. There were there were other tribes who visited the Prophet and concluded a treaty of peace since they were not interested in accepting Islam. All right, so now you may be wondering, okay, at Fatah Mecca, they have 10,000, then they have Hawazin and Ta'if, and then uh, where, where in the, in the farewell pilgrimage do you get 100,000 from? This is how they get it. From alliances, from people at the outskirts who were uh, waiting and seeing, they all accepted Islam now. Alright, farewell program in Salman. 
near the end, near the end of 980, uh, Council of Lawley, so the from the tribes around Arabia, uh, know that he was planning to personally perform pilgrimage to Mecca. About 100,000 Muslims from all over Arabia took up the opportunity to be with the Prophet and made their way to Mecca. Undertaking the journey was a clear demonstration of their newfound faith in Islam, since there were no idols left in Mecca. While performing the ritual, rituals associated with the pilgrimage, the Prophet stood on a mountain in the plains of Arafat and delivered a speech to an audience of about 150,000 Muslims, known as the Farewell Sermon. The lectures consisted of the following revolutionary points. All sums of interest on loans are canceled. All tribal retaliation for past murders are canceled. Women have rights over men who must be caref careful to fulfill their those rights. The blood and property of a Muslim is sacred, so no one should violate the sanctity uh, unjustly. No Arab has any superiority over an Arab or vice versa. The color of your skin does not determine superiority. Um, if you take these, what, one, two, three, four, five points, right? And you see they're applicable at any society at any time. Even today, what's a big one of the biggest issues financially is interest and loans and student loans and all these things we're talking about, right? If that concept didn't exist, alhamdulillah, we'd be all be in a much better position. Um, tribal retaliation for past murders, right? Uh, the sanctity of life. People didn't know that's the time to jahiliyyah. No, you go to certain places, even in Chicago, um, how gang violence happens. This is something which is, which is sad and unfortunate, but it's a reality, okay? Uh, women have rights over men who must be careful to fulfill those rights, yes. We were just raising money the other day for our transitional housing and uh, domestic abuse shelters for our sisters uh, because these things do happen in, in the Muslim community. Then we talk about the blood, property, uh, and honor also. Uh, honors mentioned the hadith as well. Um, right? The honor of a person, talking about a person, uh, backbiting about a person, taking the wealth of a person, you know, subhanAllah, it's unfortunate, but I know people who are afraid to go into business with Muslim people because they found Muslim people to cheat them more than non-Muslims. It's unfortunate. I may Allah forgive us and may Allah guide us all, but sometimes it does happen. And then uh, the whole <coughs> cultural, racial superiority thing. It's because you speak a language, it's because you're born in a certain place, or you have a certain skin color, you know, that doesn't make anybody superior or inferior. In Nakramakum and Tallahat Kakum. And the most superior in, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that has most, the most honorable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has most taqwa. Taqwa is not a measurable thing. It's not something that's just visible, right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to uh, implement the lessons that the Prophet wanted to impart upon us. Alright, last section, we have Shayan. The Prophet's death, right? Yeah. The mission was complete. He <coughs> obeyed the message of Islam and uprooted the idolatry and social vices from the entire Arabian Peninsula. About two months after returning from Mecca, the Messenger of Allah was hit with a high fever and headache. He became very weak, but continued to go to the mosque and lead the prayer sitting down, while the rest of the Muslims stood behind him. Finally, after a few days, he was too ill to even get up to go to the mosque. Every time he washed himself and tried to get up, he fainted. Thereupon, upon waking again, he signaled that Abu Bakr should lead the people in prayer while he prayed in his room. This continued for several days until he finally passed away in the morning on the 12th of Rabi Abu. Uh, what's the symbolism behind Abu Bakr leading the prayer according to the Sunni tradition? That he's suited to be the, suited to be the Khalifa and the leader after, right? There was a time when uh, the narrations differ. There's different narrations on that, that Abu Bakr of the Allah and who, uh, the Prophet said, Abu Bakr and Yusalli bin Nas, and Yawm bin Nas, that tell Abu Bakr to lead the people. So Hafsa and Aisha of the Allah and Huma, they like, Abu Bakr of the Allah, one of the things about him is that when he, sometimes when he used to lead prayers, he used to cry a lot. He would become overcome with emotion. So they're like, you know, he cries a lot, tell Umar. So then one time, uh, one narration says that Umar was led, and another narration said he was about to lead, and they said that um, Prophet got mad at him. Why did you lead when Abu Bakr was there? So he looked at Hafsa and Aisha and said, I thought you told me that Prophet told me to lead. So they're like, in that case, the you have women are like the woman of Yusuf, always plotting and scheming things. Just do what I tell you to do. Right? So that's something that uh, happened at this time. All right, go ahead. When the Muslims who were waiting inside the mosque heard what had happened, they were stunned. Omar pulled out his sword and yelled, 
Anyone who says the Prophet so is dead, I'll chop his head off right now. Perhaps he assumed that the hypocrites were spreading, spreading lies, or maybe he was so overwhelmed with grief that he was in a state of denial. He just stopped talking. Like he, like, because of the shock that he was in, he just went to the corner and just stopped talking. Right? And that time, Abu Bakr al was loaded further away. Because Prophet said there was a brief time where he kind of recovered a little bit. And that brief time, Abu Bakr al had a wife that lived a little bit outside of Medina. So that's where he was when the Prophet had passed away. When he came back and he heard that Prophet had passed away, this is what happened here. Go ahead. Abu Bakr walked into the room where the Prophet lay, verified the information, and came out to let the people know that it was the truth. But people were so emotional they were not paying attention. So Abu Bakr stood in one corner of the mosque, raised his voice, and began to speak. People, listen up. Whoever worshipped Muhammad وسلم, should know that he is now dead. But whoever worshipped Allah, know that he is alive and will never die. Then he recited a word from the Quran, which everyone was familiar with, but had eluded them through their heightened emotions. Muhammad وسلم, is only a messenger before whom many <coughs> messages have come and gone. If he dies or is killed, would you revert to your old ways? If anyone did so, he would not he would not harm Allah in the least. Allah will reward the grateful. Alright, so what happened, okay? So imagine Muhammad al Dilan has a sword out here. And he's saying anybody who says that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has passed away, I'm gonna chop off their head. Rather he meant he went to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like Musa alayhi salam did. And he's going to be back after 40 days. So Abu Bakr comes out of the room. And he first he goes into the room of the Prophet alayhi salam. He uncovers his face and he kisses him on his head. And he says that you are beautiful in life and in death. And Allah will never cause you to have two deaths. Okay? And he comes out. He sees Umar al and he tells Umar al to be quiet. Umar al is in a fit of rage. He's like, no, Allah, well, well, he keeps talking. Abu Bakr goes over there. And he starts talking. He starts saying this. When he starts talking, people leave Umar and go to Abu Bakr. Then when Umar hears what Abu Bakr al is saying, he said, when I heard those verses, it's like I heard the verses for the first time, and then he's about to fall. Then he realizes that, yes, the Prophet ﷺ did pass away. So Abu Bakr al the whole Ummah is indebted to him because at that moment, where people were overcome by their emotions, he was very rational, very wise, and very courageous <coughs> to be able to address the issues and say, okay, how are we going to move forward? It's the greatest calamity this world has ever faced. Passing away of the Prophet because, as Umayyam al Dillaran has said, that it's not about the Prophet per se, but then what he's done. No more revelation to a Prophet. Right? So we're on our own now. Right? Yes, Allah will help us, right? but then in terms of new revelation. So who picked this Ummah out, out of that uh, devastating time and helped us move forward was Abu Bakr al Which ayah is this? Is that Makkah? Huh? Is that Makkah? No. Allah Muhammad? So, Khalif bin Qabri al Rasul. This is in Surah Al-Imran. Alright, go ahead. Uh, and Muslims immediately came to their senses. It was as if this force was revealed for the first time. The message was crystal clear. The Prophet was only a vehicle through which the message of Allah was to be delivered. The success of any human being lies in connecting with the teacher of the teacher and following the guidance of Allah. Uh, so the Prophet said, like, uh, he had completed his mission. Right? Uh, right? He, uh, he conveyed the message and he fulfilled the trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed on him in the best possible way. And we all testify and we all bear witness to that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The epilogue, both friend and foe have to, uh, had to willy-nilly admit that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most successful of all religious personalities in the history of the world. A thorough inspection of history cannot reveal any other reformer who brought about such a complete transformation of society in such a little time, and with so little means at his disposal. Hundreds of evils, both spiritual and moral, from prostitution to drinking and gambling, were entirely uprooted from a society addicted to these vices. Those who walk away from the story of the Prophet ﷺ with an admiration for the character and determination of the Prophet ﷺ are entitled to such a view. Many people would admire that he was a kind-hearted man, a skillful military commander, a simple man unconcerned with things of this world, etc. Everyone sees the world through their own lenses, and they appreciate and admire certain characteristics in a person that are relevant and meaningful <coughs> to them. However, to limit yourself to seeing what you want to see, especially in a man who claimed to be the last link between God and man, is like that of a person traveling down a dangerous path. He meets a man on the way who warns him about the impending dangers that lie ahead, but instead of focusing on advice or trying to determine whether the man is honest, 
He begins to admire his clothes and is amused by the man's accent. Muhammad ﷺ preached a message and warned about the dangers of not following that guidance. Justice would require that his claim to prophethood be at least given some due consideration by those who have been presented with the message of Islam. Uh, yeah, no, that's an important point. I think it got lost in the analogy. Is that you can talk about Prophet's character, you can talk about his, um, you know, his fairness, his kindness, and all that, which is very important. Which is very important. But if you want to be honest and you really want to benefit from the Prophet, follow his message. Follow his message. So that's the point he's saying. Someone's on the rope. He's telling you, let's go this way. I'm guiding you. There's a storm coming. There's an animal coming. There's someone coming to attack you. Right? Come with me. I'll take you to safety. Rather than following that person to safety, like, you have nice shoes. You have nice shirt. Right? Yeah, he does. No doubt about it. But is appreciating his shirt and shoes going to save you if you don't follow him to that destination? So similarly, we appreciate everything about the Prophet. But if a person just appreciates the Prophet, but doesn't follow the teachings of the Prophet is that appreciation in and of itself going to save a person? No. Right? We can talk about the Sunnah as much as we want. We can talk about how great the Prophet was and how, how, how important it is to follow Sunnah. But unless we actually follow it, is our appreciation and gratitude true appreciation and gratitude? No. Okay? Um, okay. So, alhamdulillah, we finished. This is, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give us the ability to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet in all aspects of our lives. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad wa ala 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 Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad wa ala We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his blessing to the Prophet and the companions of the Prophet and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even though our actions don't reach their actions but our love and, and uh, love, let our love for them allow us to be with them in Jannah al Firdaus. Mm-hmm. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let us respect, value, and appreciate the dedication of the Prophet sallallahu and his companions of the Allah And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us uh, take them as true role models in every aspect of our lives. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, 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 alham